Five Children and It by E. Nesbitt. Chapter 11. And last, The Last Wish. Of course, you who see above that this is the eleventh and last chapter know very well that the day in which this chapter tells must be the last one in which Cyril, Anthea, and Robert will have a chance to get anything out of the Samiade or Sand Fairy. But the children themselves did not know this. They were full of rosy visions, and whereas, on the other days, they had often found it extremely difficult to think of anything really nice to wish for, their brains were now full of the most beautiful and sensible ideas. This, as Jane remarked afterwards, is always the way. Everyone was up extra early that morning, and these plans were hopefully discussed in the garden before breakfast. The odd idea of one hundred pounds in modern Florence was still first favorite, but there were others that ran its course, the chief of which being the pony each idea, that they each would have one pony. This was a great advantage. You could wish for a pony each during the morning, ride it all day, have it vanish at sunset, and wish it back again the next day, which would be a very economy as when it came to stabling. But at breakfast, the two things happened. First, there was a letter from Mother. Granny was better, and Mother and Father hoped to be home by the afternoon. A cheer arose, and of course the news at once scattered all of the pre-breakfast wish ideas, for everyone saw quite plainly that a wish of the day must be something to please Mother, and not to please themselves. "'I wonder what she would like,' pondered Cyril. "'She'd like us all to be good,' said Jane primly. "'Yes, but that is so dull,' said Cyril. "'And besides, I should hope we could be like that without any sand fairy wishing us. "'No, it must be something splendid that we can't possibly get without wishing for.' "'Look out,' said Anthea with a warning voice. "'Don't forget yesterday. "'Remember, we can get our wishes just whenever we happen to be and say I wish. "'Don't let ourselves wish for anything silly.' "'All right,' said Cyril. "'You needn't talk so much.' Just then, Martha came in with a jug full of hot water for the tea. "'A blessing we're all alive to eat breakfast,' she said darkly. "'Why, what happened?' everyone asked. "'Oh, nothing,' said Martha. "'Only, it just seems to me nobody's safe from being murdered in their bed nowadays.' "'Why?' said Jane, in a thrill of horror. "'Has someone been murdered in their beds?' Well, "'Not exactly murdered,' said Martha. "'But they might as well have. "'There's been burglars over at Pease Marsh. "'Beale's just told me. "'And they took every single one of Lady Chesterton's diamonds and jewels and things. "'And she's going out of one fainting fit from another, "'with hardly time to say all my diamonds in between. "'And Lord Chelton's away in London.' "'Lady Chattleton said Anthea. "'We've seen her. "'She wears a red and white dress, "'and she has no children of her own "'and can't abide other folkses.' "'Oh, that's her,' said Martha. "'Well, she put all her trust in riches, you see. "'And now she's served her just desserts. "'They say that diamonds and things she had "'were worth thousands of pounds, and... "'Ah, oh, well, I mustn't be talking about this. When "'There's so much cleaning to be done "'before your ma comes home.' "'I don't see why she should ever have so many diamonds,' said Anthea, when Martha had flounced off. "'She was not at all a nice lady. "'And Mother hasn't got any diamonds, and hardly any jewels, or anything. "'When I grow up, I'll buy Mother no end of diamonds,' said Robert. "'If she wants them, I shall make loads and loads of money, exploring all over the place.' "'Wouldn't that be jolly grand?' said Jane dreamily, "'if Mother could find all those lovely things, and necklaces, and tiaras.' "'Tierras,' said Cyril. "'Tierras, then, and rings, and, and everything in her room when she came home.' "'The others gazed at her in horror. "'Well, now she will,' said Robert. "'You've wished it. My goodness, Jane. "'And our only chance now is to find the Samiade, and—' If it's in a good temper, he may take back the wish and give us another. But if not, well, oh, goodness knows what we're in for. The police, of course, and don't cry silly, will stand by you. 
father says we need never to be afraid if we didn't do anything wrong and always speak the truth but cyril and anthea exchanged a gloomy glance they remembered how convincing the truth had been about the samiad when they tried to tell the police once before it was a day of misfortunes for of course the samiad could not be found nor the jewels though every one of the children searched their mother's room again and again of course robert said we can't find them because you wished that mother be the one to find them oh perhaps she'll think that they were left in the house for years and years and never know that they were stolen ones oh yes cyril said scornfully then mother will only be the receiver of stolen goods and that's almost jolly well as worse according to the law another and exhaustive search of the sand pit failed to reveal the samiad so the children went back to the house slowly and sadly i don't care said anthea stoutly we'll tell mother the truth and she'll give them back and everything will be all right do you really think so said cyril slowly do you think she'll believe us could anyone believe us about the samiad without having seen it for themselves she'll think we were pretending or else she'll think we're raving mad and send us to the madhouse how would you like it he turned suddenly on the miserable jane how would you like to be shut up in a madhouse with padded walls and anything to do but stick straw in your hair all day and listen to the howlings of the other maniacs make up your minds all of you it's no use telling mother but it's true said jane of course it is but it's not true enough for grown-up people to believe said anthea cyril's right let's put flowers in all the vases and try not to think about the diamonds after all everything has come out right in the end the other times so they filled all of the pots they could find with flowers asters and zinnias and the loose leaf but late roses from the wall of the stable yard to the house looked picture perfect and almost as soon as lunch was cleared away mother arrived and was clasping in eight lovely arms it was very difficult indeed not to tell her about the samiad at once because they had gotten into the habit of telling her everything but they did succeed in not telling her mother on her side had plenty to tell them about granny and granny's pigeons and auntie emma's lame tame donkey she was very delighted by the flowers all around the house and everything seemed so natural and so pleasant now that she was home again that the children almost thought that they had dreamed about the samiad but when mother moved towards the stairs to go up to her bedroom and take off her bonnet the eight arms clung around her just as if she was the mother of only two children one the lamb and the other some sort of octopus don't go up mummy said anthea let's take your things up for you i will said cyril we want you to come and look at the rose tree said robert oh don't go upstairs said jane helplessly nonsense dears said mother briskly i'm not such an old woman yet that i can't take off my own bonnet myself besides i must wash my hands so she went up and the children followed her exchanging glances of gloomy foreboding mother took off her bonnet it was a very pretty hat really with white roses on it and when she had taken it off again she went to the dressing table to do her pretty hair on the table between the ring stand and the pincushion lay a green leather case and mother opened it oh how lovely she cried it was a ring a large pearl with a shiny many lighted diamond set around it whatever did this come from she asked trying it on on her wedding finger which had fit perfectly how ever did it come to be here i don't know said each of the children truthfully father must have told martha to put it here oh i'll run downstairs and ask her let me look at that said anthea who knew martha would not be able to see the ring but when martha was asked of course she denied putting the ring there and so did elsa the cook mother came back to her bedroom very much interested and pleased about the ring but when she opened the dressing table door she found a long case containing an almost priceless diamond necklace she was more interested still though not so pleased in the wardrobe when she went to put away her bonnet she found a tiara and several brooches and the rest of the jewelry that turned up in various parts of the room during the next half hour the children looked more and more uncomfortable and now jane began to sniff mother looked at her gravely jane she said i am sure you know something about this now think before you speak tell me the truth we found a fairy said jane obediently 
No nonsense, please, said her mother sharply. Don't be silly, Jane, Cyril interrupted. Then he went on desperately. Look here, mother. We've never seen the things before. But Lady Chesterton of Peasmarsh lost all her jewelry by some wicked burglars last night. Could they have possibly stashed it here? All drew in deep breaths. They were saved. But why would they have put it here? Asked Mother reasonably. Surely it would have been easier and safer to make off with it cleanly. I suppose, said Cyril, they thought it better to wait for, for sunset, or, I mean, before they made off with it. No one but us knew you were coming back today. I must send for the police at once, said Mother. Oh, how I wish your father was here. Wouldn't it be better to wait until he comes, asked Robert, knowing that his father would not be home until after sunset. No, no, it can't wait a minute. With all of this on my mind, cried Mother. All this was the heap of jewelry now collected on the bed. They put them all in the wardrobe, and Mother locked it. Then Mother called Martha. Martha, she said, has any stranger been in my room since I've been away? Now answer me truthfully. No, Mum, answered Martha. Leastways, what I meant to say, she stopped. Come, said her mistress kindly. I see someone has. You must tell me at once. Don't be frightened. I'm sure you haven't done anything wrong. Martha burst into heavy sobs. I was going to give you a warning this very day, Mum. I'm leaving at the end of the month, I am, on account of me getting married to a good, respectable man. A gamekeeper he is by trade. Oh, Mum, I wouldn't have deceived you. His name is Beale, and as true as I stand here, I was going to tell you. And he came here today, and he says to me, Martha, my beauty, which I ain't and never was, but you know how them men will go on when he fancies you. And he says, I can't stand to see you toiling, and me not doing anything while I got these strong arms. And, well, he helped me clean the windows, Mum, inside and out. It's the gospel truth. Were you with him the whole time? asked her mistress. He was outside and I was in, except for fetching up a fresh pail of water. That will do, said the children's mother. I'm not pleased with you, Martha, but you have spoken the truth, and that counts for something. When Martha was gone, the children clung around their mother. Oh, mummy darling, cried Anthea, it isn't Beale's fault. It really isn't. He's a nice man. He's very honorable and respectable. Don't let the police take him away, mummy. Don't, don't, don't. It was truly awful. He was an innocent man accused of robbery, through that silly wish of Jane's, and it was absolutely useless to tell the truth. All longed to, but they thought of madhouses. "'Is there a car to hereabouts?' asked Mother feverishly. "'I must drive into Rochester and tell the police about this at once.' All the children sobbed. "'There's a cart at the farm, but don't go, don't go, wait until Father comes home.' Mother took not the faintest notice. When she set her mind to a thing, she always went straight through with it, and in this respect she was rather like Anthea. "'Now look here, Cyril,' she said, sticking a large, sharp pin into her hat. "'I leave you in charge. Stay in the dressing room. You can pretend to be swimming boats in the bath or something.' "'Just make sure no one enters my room. Remember,' No one knows the jewels are there except me, and all of you, and the wicked thieves who put them there. Now, Robert, you stay in the garden and watch the windows. If anyone tries to get in, you must run and tell the two farmers that set up watch at the kitchen. I'll tell them there's dangerous characters about, and that's true enough. Now, remember, I trust you both, but I don't think they'll try to go anywhere until after dark. So you should be quite safe. Goodbye, my darlings. And she locked her bedroom door and went off with the key in her pocket. The children could not help admiring the dashing and decided way in which she had acted. They thought how useful she would have been in organizing an escape from some sort of tight place in which they had found themselves of late, as a consequence of their ill-timed wishes. She's a born general, said Cyril. But I don't know what's going to happen to us. Even if the girls were to find the old Samiade and get it to take the jewelry away, Mother would only think that we had something to do with the burglaries. Or else that the police would think we've got them. Or else that she'd been fooling them the whole time and wasting their time. Oh, what a ghastly mess we're in this time, no mistake. He 
he savagely made a paper boat and began to float it in the bath, as he had been told to. Robert went in the garden and sat down on the worn yellow grass with a miserable head between his helpless hands. Anthea and Jane whispered together in the passage downstairs. Martha's voice could be heard in the kitchen, grumbling, loud and long. "'It's simply too dreadfully awful,' said Anthea. "'How do we even know that all of the diamonds are there? "'If they aren't, the police will think that mother and father have got them hidden away somewhere, "'and they're, they're only giving up a small portion of them. "'And they'll be put in prison. "'And we shall be branded as outcasts and the children of felons. "'And that won't even be very nice for mother and father either,' she added as an afterthought. "'But what can we do?' asked Jane. "'Nothing. At least we might look for the Samiate again. "'It's a very, very hot day. He might have come out to warm his whiskers.' "'He won't give us any more beastly wishes today,' said Jane. "'He gets crosser and crosser every time we see him. I believe he hates giving us wishes.' Anthea had been shaking her head gloomily. Now she stopped shaking it so suddenly, and it really looked as though she were pricking her ears. "'What is it?' said Jane. "'Oh, have you thought of something?' Our one chance, cried Anthea dramatically. The one lone hope. Come on! At a brisk trot, she led the way to the sandpit. Oh, joy! There was the Samiad, baking in a golden sandy hollow and preening its whiskers happily in the glowing afternoon sun. The moment it saw them, it whisked around and began to burrow. It evidently preferred its own company to theirs. But Anthea was too quick for it. She caught it by its shoulders gently but firmly, and she held it there. "'Here, none of that!' said the Samiade. "'Let go of me, will you?' But Anthea held on him fast. "'Dear, kind, darling Samiade, she said breathlessly. "'Oh, yes, it's all very well,' it said. "'You want another wish, I expect, but I can't keep slaving away from morning down till night, giving people their wishes. I must have some time to myself!' "'Do you hate giving us wishes?' asked Anthea gently her voice trembling with excitement. Of course I do, it said. Leave me go or I'll bite you. I will. Do you want to risk it? Anthea risked it and held on. Look here, she said. Don't bite me and listen to reason. If you'll only do what we want today, we'll never ask you for another wish as long as we live. The Samiade was moved. I'd do anything, it said in a tearful voice. I'd almost burst myself to give you one wish after another, as long as you never, ever, ever ask me after today. If you knew how I hate to blow myself all up for other people's wishes, and how frightened I'm always that I'd strain a muscle or something, and then to wake up every morning, and you've got to do it again, you wouldn't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like. Its voice cracked with emotion. It's the last word, don't. Anthea set it gently down in the sand. It's all over now, she said soothingly. We promise faithfully never to ask you for another wish after today. Well, go ahead, said the Samiade. Let's get this over with. How many do you think you can do? I don't know, as long as I can hold out. Well, first, I wish Lady Chatterton finds her lost jewels, all of them. The Samiade blew itself out and collapsed. Done, it said. I wish, said Anthea more slowly, that Mother doesn't find the police. Done, said the creature after the proper interval. I wish, said Jane suddenly, Mother could forget all this nonsense about the diamonds. Done, said the Samiade in a weaker voice. Would you like to rest a little? asked Anthea considerately. Yes, please, said the Samiade. And before we go any further, will you wish something for me? Can't you do wishes for yourself? Of course I can't, it said. We're always expected to give each other wishes. But now I'm the last one, so... What's your wish? I wish that you may never be able, any of you, to tell anyone a word about me. Why? asked Jane. Don't you see? If you told grown-ups, I should have no peace in my life at all. They'd grab a hold of me and would wish for silly things all the time. And scientific people would grab a hold of me and try to make me do things that would last after sunset. I'd 
never have a moment's peace again. Anthea repeated the Samiate's wish, and it blew itself out to a larger size than it had ever yet attained. And now, it said that it, as it collapsed, can I do anything more for you? One more thing, and I think that'll clear this all up. Doesn't it, Jane? I wish that Martha would forget about the diamond ring and Mother would forget about the keeper cleaning the windows. Now, said the Samiade faintly, I'm almost worn out. Is there anything else? No, only thank you kindly for all you've done for us, and I hope you'll have a good long sleep, and I hope we shall see you again one day. Is that a wish? it asked in a weak voice. Yes, please, the girls said together. Then, for the last time in this story, they saw the Samiade blow itself out and collapse suddenly. It nodded to them, blinked its long, snail-like eyes, and burrowed and disappeared at last into the sand. That should do it, right? said Jane. I'm sure it has, said Anthea. Come home. Let's tell the boys. Anthea found Cyril gloomily sitting over the paper boat and told him what had happened. Jane told Robert the two tales were only just ended when Mother walked in hot and dusty. She explained that she had been driving to Rochester to buy the girls' autumn school dresses when the axle had broken, and but for the narrowness of the lane and the soft hedges she would have been thrown off. As it was, she was not hurt at all, but she'd had to walk home. "'Oh, my dearest little chicks,' she said. "'I am simply dying for a cup of tea. Do run and see if the water is boiled.' "'So you see, it's all right,' Jane whispered. "'She mustn't have remembered anything.' "'No more than does Martha,' said Anthea, "'who had been the one to ask for the kettle. "'As the servants set their tea, Beale the gamekeeper dropped in. "'He brought the welcome news "'that Lady Chatterton's diamonds "'had not been lost at all. "'Lord Chatterton had taken them "'to be reset and cleaned, "'and the maid knew about it, "'had gone on holiday, "'and so everything was all right.' "'I wonder if we ever shall see the Samiate again,' Jane said wistfully. "'As they walked into the garden, while Mother was putting the lamb to bed. "'I'm sure we shall,' said Cyril, "'if you really wished for it.' "'We've promised to never ask it for another wish,' said Anthea. "'I never want to,' said Robert earnestly. "'They did see it again, of course, but not in this story. "'And it was not in a sand pit either, but a very... Very different place. It was in... Ah, uh, but I mustn't say any more. For now. <laughs>